Today I'd like to review Hendrickson's um, facsimile 1560 Geneva Bible. This one is in black genuine leather. There's the ISBN. That was uh, the price, the list price. It is actually going for about $70 at Christian Book Distributors. And there's also a less expensive hardback, which I think is about $40. Here's the book itself. It is a rather large, genuine leather Bible. It has uh, gilt edges, as you see. Headband there is yellow and black. This is the tail band. Single ribbon marker, quarter of an inch wide. It seems plenty long enough. I'll show you the spine. It is a flat spine book, and so when it opens, it tends to curve. When the uh, the book is new, although it is smith sewn, it will not lie flat. But after you've worked with it and broken it in, it uh, lies flat sufficiently well. The uh, construction is paced off or paced down. I'll show you a corner. The material here seems to be some sort of a synthetic uh, bonded to the cardstock. So it's definitely not uh, not a high-end construction. It's the grain and the leather. Nothing particularly odd or interesting about the the grain. The paper itself is very thick. I. Uh, I measured the thickness of these pages, and uh, sheet thickness is something like 86 micrometers, which is very thick. The paper weight then should be something like 79 GSM. There is very little show through. I don't know how well you can see that. Geneva Bible is visible to the eye, but uh, you can see it much better when you lift it away from the page so you can get some light flowing onto it from the other side very, very little show through in this facsimile. The, uh, the dimensions of the book are uh, 9 and 9 sixteenths inches tall. It is 7 5 sixteenths inches wide. It's 2 and 3 eighths inches thick. To give you a better sense for the size, here it is in comparison with the Reformation Study Bible. They're roughly the same size. The uh, Geneva Bible is a bit wider, as you can see, but they're very similar in thickness and in height. The uh, 1560 Geneva Bible included the Apocrypha. So here's another Bible that also includes the Apocrypha. This is my Cambridge uh, cameo. And uh, you can see it dwarfs the cameo. King James Version Bibles uh, were commonly printed with the Apocrypha until 1827 when the British and Foreign Bible Society uh, made a resolution never to print or distribute Bibles containing the Apocrypha. Uh, formerly, before 1827, it was uh, much more common than afterwards. 1560, it, it did, did include them, and I'll show you those briefly as we do a walkthrough. So we talked about this. This is the uh, title page for the facsimile. Geneva Bible, 1560 edition, Hendrickson Publications, 2007. There's the ISBN for the cloth edition as well. It's based on a facsimile produced at the University of Wisconsin in 1969. They made some uh, changes to it, though. They've improved it in a couple of ways. We'll talk about that briefly in a moment. Printed in the United States of America, it talks about a cover illustration, which really must go with the, uh, the hardback. There's a preface. There's an introduction that talks about history. I'll show quickly a couple of charts that, if you're interested in getting the background, you can view those, uh, freeze and look at those. Uh, bottom line, though, is the Geneva Bible was published during the time of Bloody Mary when she was burning Protestants as heretics at the stake.
oh, some scholar has fled to Geneva and made a translation of the Bible. And they came back with this, the Geneva Bible. The particular uh, translation facsimile that we're looking at is the Scheid Library copy. Scheid Library is at Princeton University. Some of the pages were too um, bad. They had stains or wormholes. So they supplemented those pages. They used uh, Chapin Library pages there. And Chapin Library is at Williams College, which I understand is in Massachusetts. This book does not have page numbers, it has sheet numbers. So this is a list of the Chapin Library pages. The R means recto, that's the front of the sheet. V means verso, that's the back of the sheet. You'll see those, those sheet numbers later on. There is a bibliography for anybody that wants to learn more about the Geneva Bible. Another title page, uh, still another page, which shows that this was printed at Geneva, um, 1560. There's a woodcut here, the children of Israel about to cross the Red Sea. Table of contents. A uh, epistle to Queen Elizabeth, which is essentially encouraging her to be as intolerant of Roman Catholics as the Roman Catholics were intolerant of the Reformed. There's an epistle to the reader that explains to them how to use the Geneva Bible. And then we get to the Geneva Bible itself. In a moment we'll come back and look at uh, the layout in more detail and talk about things like font size. I want to show you the Apocrypha as we flip forward. Uh, this uh, actually contains two books that are not in the Roman Catholic Apocrypha. Uh, first Esdras here, and second Esdras there. Now someone with a copy of the Douay Remus might object and say that I have first and second Esdras in mine. Well, your first and second Esdras are Ezra and Nehemiah. This first and second Esdras are two different books entirely. We get to um, Matthew in the New Testament. And I'll just point out quickly the uh, sheet number versus page number issue here. This page is page 12. The very next page is page 13. And there's no per page number on the other side. So you have, we're looking at 12 recto here. Opposite is page 12 verso. At the back of the book, there is... Two, there are two tables. The first table is kind of a dictionary of proper names. And the second table is a primitive concordance. After the two tables, there is a chronology which deals with Paul with uh, years after the birth of Christ, years since uh, Paul's conversion, and then the years of the reign of Tiberius, Caligula, Claudius, and Nero. So I will set this up so that we can look at things in more detail. The Geneva Bible was uh, innovative in its time. I'll show you here a graphic that lists some of the innovations. So when you look at this, um, it looks normal, like a normal, moder relatively modern King James Version, except for some oddities in the print that we'll look at later to column format, verse by verse. But those kinds of things were novelties at the time. In, ad in addition, it uses uh, italic text for translator su supplied information, which was uh, an innovation at the time. So this is the basic layout. You see here, Psalm starts on its own page, but that doesn't uh, always have to happen. Here you'll see Esther starts in the middle of the page. The layout has the sheet title on the right-hand page in the upper right. There is no page number to the left. You have um, title, and then what's called an argument, which is a summary of the contents of the entire book. In each chapter, here in this case, each psalm has uh, a description of the basic topics discussed in the psalm. This is uh, what you'd commonly see in many modern King James Version Bibles. The uh, text is in two columns, each 52 millimeters wide, and there are about 39 characters per line. Page dimensions are 233 millimeters tall, 177 millimeters wide. 
margin at the top is 9 millimeters, bottom is 10, inner margin is 25, that's about an inch, outer margin is 14. Let's look more closely. This font, you see the decorative drop cap, unlike the uh, Canterbury, it is not in red, but it's nicely decorated. <clears throat> the de decorative drop cap, followed by the text, which is advertised as a seven-point text. My comparisons to Times New, New Roman tells me that it's close to about an eight to eight point five point in Times New Roman. <clears throat> if you use the uh, Pica system, where you measure the number of lines and the distance traveled, it's something like um, nine and a quarter points, where in the Pica system, one point is 0.3514 millimeters. Marginal notes over here look like they're about six points. <clears throat> the, uh, the line spacing is close. You can see places like uh, here where the comma and the D are very close to each other. <clears throat> but um, I don't get the uh, any sort of sense of uh, closeness or here's another where this uh, S and the comma are almost touching. Uh, but I don't get the sense of claustrophobia from this and I think it's because the columns are relatively narrow. The uh, tracking is uh, easy on my eye at least. I don't see any uh, letters about to collide with each other. So now we are in Genesis at Genesis 1.1 1, 1, and I just want to show you some of the, the features of the Bible, some of the things that you wouldn't see in your modern King James Version. Um, you have right here what looks like a Y with an E over the top of it. In the beginning God created, and you might be tempted to say ye heaven and the earth, uh, but actually that's a thorn, uh, an old and middle English character that makes a the, the sound. So that's the heaven and the earth. <clears throat> You'll notice here that heaven has a U in it where we expect a V. <clears throat> That's the way things were printed in those days. The, the V inside of a letter was uh, printed as a U, just like the U at the beginning of a word, upon, uh, is printed as a V. Here you see another V printed as a U and moved. <clears throat> S's are different and were different uh, in those days back in the 16th century. Um, God said the S looks very much like a modern F, does not have very much of a crossbar at all. I've moved us forward to the beginning of Jeremiah so that we can look at another peculiarity, which is the lack of the letter J. The words of Jeremiah, Jeremiah is written with a capital I. Uh, the reason is because the uh, letter J hadn't made it into the English language yet. I think that occurred in the 1630s or 1640s. So I did double duty as uh, both a, a vowel, as here in Jeremiah, and as a consonant, making a J sound at the beginning of the word. Um, we talked about the S's um, and the V's and the U's. Uh, another thing that's uh, peculiar here is uh, the use of a line to indicate an emitted letter in order to get all this into the line, all those characters into the line. The uh, printer omitted an N here in nations, but put a line over the top of the O. So the line over the top of a character in the word typically means that either an N or an M was left out, and you're to understand that the word did it does include it. Uh, I wanted to show you some of the print non-uniformity that occurs in this book. My sense is that that's probably due to the uh, print non-uniformity in the original and not due to Hendrickson's reproduction, but of course I can't know for sure. You're looking at uh, sheet 116 on the recto side, and I'm going to pull it over so that you can see the same side of 129 side by side. And so uh, this is very nice and darkly printed to the left and fairly lightly printed to the right. It, uh, the print on the right is still usable. Uh, there's nothing that's invisible there, uh, but this is much easier on the eye. That's much more pleasant to the left.
This kind of thing does occur quite frequently in the Bible. Now you're looking at uh, Genesis 3.14, and uh, here you see the uh, initial S's that look like F's. You see a line over the E, uh, which indicates that the N in serpent has been removed for printing purposes. I'm going to show this in comparison to a cameo. This is the same verse in the cameo on the right. And we'll show the two prints side by side. I think the cameo type is just a bit larger, and it's certainly printed more boldly in this particular edition, but it's not much larger. They're very comparable. Uh, one thing you might notice is that the uh, word Lord in the cameo, L, capital O, capital R, capital D for Yahweh, is uh, printed in small caps, and Lord in the Geneva Bible has lowercase letters, which indicates to me that that convention of using all caps for Lord had not been introduced yet in 1560. Um, there's another option if you're interested in buying the Geneva Bible, and that's this Tolle Lege Press version. I'm going to show you the Tolle Lege Press type face off to the left here. Perhaps I should zoom out so that you can see a little more of it at the same time. So it's also a modern print. They've taken the Geneva Bible and they've re reset the type using modern characters. And so it has a more professional look. Um, but the book on the left has more character. The uh, Tolle Lege Press version does have uh, footnotes and they are at the foot of the page rather than in the margin. It's also a, uh, a different edition. Um, Hendrickson is the 1560, while this Tolle Lege Press is the 1599 Geneva Bible. Well, there is some glean, some sheen, sheen to the paper. It's uh, hardly noticeable at all. Uh, the paper is uh, does reflect in a very uh, diffuse way. It, very little specular reflection. And that, with the very thick paper, which greatly reduces see-through, uh, makes it a pleasant reading experience once you get used to the old-style print. King James I, uh, who ruled for England from 1603 to 1625 when he died, uh, detested the Geneva Bible, and I'll show you here why. Uh, we're in Daniel 6. This is the story of where uh, the rulers and governors uh, conspired against uh, Daniel. They set, set him up. They had the king pass a decree that uh, no one could ask a petition of anyone, God or man, for 30 days except the king. And of course Daniel, as he always did, prayed with his window open, praying towards Jerusalem. Uh, and so he was uh, convicted of the crime of praying to someone other than the king and cast into the lion's den. Uh, when he came out, uh, the king was quite happy. And Daniel explained to the king. Then Daniel said unto the king, O king, live forever. Uh, my God hath sent his angel, and hath shut the lion's mouths, that they have not hurt me, for my justice was found out to be before him was found out before him, and unto thee, O king, I have done no hurt. So let's look at the uh, side notes here. There's a note H which says, My just cause and uprightness in this thing, wherein I was charged, is approved of God. So that is saying that um, it is right to do, to disobey the king's commandment uh, when you're obeying what God wants you to do. And, of course, King James wouldn't have liked that because who decides what God wants you to do? Uh, King James would be like the one, the one, would like to be the one to do that. Um, For my justice was found out to be before him, and unto thee, O king, I have done no hurt. So we have an I here, and it says, uh, For he did disobey the king's wicked commandment. Kings make wicked commandments? I think King James disagreed with that vehemently. Uh, he disobeyed the king's wicked commandment to obey God, and so did no injury to the king, 
who walk to command nothing uh, whereby God should be dishonored. But who decides uh, what dishonors God and what doesn't? This almost uh, seems to place religious people above the king and allow them to veto his actions by deciding that whether they are righteous or not. I think this is uh, the major issue that James had with the Geneva Bible. So, in uh, 1604, when the Puritans uh, came and petitioned James at the Hampton Court Conference for a new translation, James was happy to do that. Uh, the Church of England at that time was using the Bishop's Bible, but the uh, Geneva Bible was very popular, and uh, <coughs> the, uh, the king uh, allowed there to be a new translation as long as there were notes, no notes such as these in the book. That is, no notes other than translation notes. One of my favorite uh, hard spots in the uh, King James Version New Testament is here in 2 Corinthians 6, uh, verses um, 11, 12, and 13. And you're looking right now at uh, the Geneva Bible translation of those verses, but you should be seeing a graphic that uh, it has the King James Version on the left and the 1560 Geneva Bible on the right, uh, printed in the same font, in the same style. And uh, you'll notice that uh, while the King James Version has no notes, the Geneva Bible has three. Uh, personally, I think that the Geneva Bible is actually more clear here even without the notes. Uh, but with the notes, it's much more straightforward what Paul is trying to tell the Corinthians in the 1560 Geneva Bible, uh, to my mind at least. Uh, this helps me understand why the Geneva Bible was so popular and why it was still used well after the publication of the King James Version in 1611. You are looking now at uh, the fourth chapter of Galatians, verses 17 and 18, which I uh, consider another one of the hard spots in the King James Version New Testament. This is the uh, Geneva Bible translation you see here, but I again have a graphic uh, prepared which shows the 1611 King James Version on the left and the 1560 Geneva Bible on the right. You can uh, freeze this to read it more carefully if you like. My sense again is that the Geneva Bible is more clear even without its notes. And then with the notes added, notes uh, F and S that you see in the right margin, it's, uh, it's much plainer what's meant uh, to the right than to the left. I think it's always interesting to see how different translations read in passages that have become familiar through reading the King James Version. I have us here at Luke chapter 2, uh, the birth story. And it came to pass in those days that there came a commandment from Augustus Caesar that all the world should be taxed. This first taxing was made when Cyrenius was governor of Syria. Therefore went all to be taxed, every man to his own city, and Joseph also went up from Galilee out of a city called Nazareth into Judea unto the city of David, which is called Bethlehem, because he was of the house and lineage of David, to be taxed with Mary that was given. We'll go up to the top of the next column. to be taxed with Mary that was given him to wife, which was with child. And so it was that while they were there, the days were accomplished that she should be delivered, and she brought forth her first begotten son, and wrapped him in swaddling clothes, and laid him in a crush, because there was no room for them in the inn. And there were in the same country shepherds abiding in the field, and keeping watch by night because of their flock. And lo, the angel of the Lord came upon them, and the glory of the Lord shone about them, and they were sore afraid. Then the angel said unto them, Be not afraid, for behold, I bring you tidings of great joy that shall be to all the people. That is, that unto you is born this day, in the city of David a Savior, which is Christ the Lord. And this shall be a sign to you, 
you shall find the child swaddled and laid in a crash. And straightway there was with the angel a multitude of heavenly soldiers praying God and saying, Glory be to God in the heavens, and peace in earth and towards men, good will. If you're interested in the Geneva Bible, as far as I know, there are really two major choices these days. If someone knows of other editions that are being printed, please uh, put a comment in the comments section. But you have the Hendrickson 1560 facsimile, which has character, because it's printed the way the original was printed. It is, it is as if you had one of the originals that came off the production line in 1560. The same typeface, the same notes, the same formatting. Your other option is a 1599 edition, which uh, is in a modern typeface, um, and it's much easier to read. All the notes are at the bottom of the page. 1599 edition did differ from the 1560 in a number of ways. The translation was altered slightly, and the notes um, were amplified. There are quite a lot more in the way of notes, particularly in the book of Revelation. You might get lucky and be able to find uh, a real true facsimile 1599 out there somewhere. That might be quite expensive. I uh, personally, I prefer the Hendrickson. I like the uh, thick paper. I like the creamy colored paper. And I enjoy reading it uh, the way it looked when it came off the, off the press in 1560. So that's my review and thanks very much for watching.